The relationship that an audience member has with a particular piece of media is, in a worst case scenario, something that ceases as soon as they stop engaging with that work. When you see a movie and you stop thinking about the movie as soon as you walk out of the theater, then it was a bad movie. But a good piece of media, be it a show, movie, comic, or even a painting, is something that sticks with the audience long after they stop being exposed directly to it. If there's a game you haven't played in years that you still think back to after all this time, or a particular line from a song that gets stuck in your head, then you understand the influence that media can have. This relationship, however, is usually something spurred on by a deep connection to the work's themes or characters. The lessons we learn and emotions we experience vicariously through fictional characters can stick with us nearly as much as our own lived experiences. It's much less common for that paratextual relationship to persist as a matter of design. Gravity Falls began in mid-2013 and aired its final mainline episode in 2016, but since then, it's managed to maintain a level of loyalty from its viewers bordering on fanatical, which of course is typical of any fandom. And yet the way that this fanaticism came about is something utterly unique in how intentional it all was. The relationship between the audience, the work, and the creators is so wildly different from the norm due to the level of meta elements incorporated into the show itself. Everything from ciphers in the credits, to languages that hint towards future plots, to ARG elements that encourage viewership not to end just because the credits have finished rolling. As such, simply watching Gravity Falls from start to finish does not give you the full fan experience in the way that it would with many other TV shows. Though it's not as though the actual experience is something that you can even get these days. If you want to figure out the key to one of the ciphers, there are multiple web resources that will hold your hand through the entire experience. If you want to guess wildly at what might happen next, there's no need to, as not only is the question long since answered, but a guy on Reddit probably accurately predicted the twist months in advance. It's not to say as if Gravity Falls is a show that can no longer be enjoyed though. Even if some of the magic from the show is gone, much of the appeal still existed within the 22 minute segments in their own right. And so that's what this video is going to focus on. It's a middle ground between not talking about it at all, and spoiling everything to the point that there's very little reason to engage with it in the first place, while still feeling like I get to tell a complete story. As usual, this video will be split into individual episode retrospectives, which themselves are split into three sections, recap, review, and wrap up. Recap for a general detailing of the plot, review to summarize my thoughts on the episode as they pertain to the show as a whole, and wrap up for things I can't find another place for. Tourist Trapped The story starts with an in-medias res glimpse at Dipper and Mabel Pines, two siblings on the run from an unseen monster before flashing back to when it all started. The two had moved to Gravity Falls with their tourist trap running great uncle, who they call Grunkle Stan, as their parents wanted them to get some time outdoors over the summer. And while Dipper is suspicious of the new town, Mabel is excited to start a new chapter of her life and meet a boy. Eventually, Mabel succeeds in getting a date with one, Norman, but a mysterious book Dipper finds in the forest leads him to believe that Mabel's new boyfriend is actually a zombie. He gathers evidence of her boyfriend's condition before ultimately rushing to rescue her from the threat, only to learn that, rather than a zombie, Norman is a bunch of gnomes in disguise, intent on making Mabel their queen. She refuses, and so they decide to kidnap her instead, which leads to the chase scene at the start of the episode. In the end, Mabel is able to defuse the situation by defeating their leader with a leaf blower after tricking him into believing she accepted the offer. The two twins in the episode declaring that, despite Dipper's book stating not to trust anybody, they can rely on each other. The role of a first episode in any TV show is to introduce the setting, tone, and characters to the audience, while also being entertaining enough to sell those concepts as well. But in Gravity Falls, a large amount of the show's appeal comes from the underlying mystery elements, and as such, this episode instead has the limitation where it also needs to ensure that there's a balance struck between telling too much and ruining the mystery, or telling too little and failing to engage the audience. Ultimately, this line is written by connecting the characters to the setting. The plot itself is engaged by Mabel trying to meet a guy, and Dipper trying to find something to justify his uneasiness. And by these things kicking off the mystery element, we see how the show won't simply incorporate these elements independently. Each one is dependent on the others to work, and nothing exists in a vacuum. 
And so it's Dipper's mistrusting personality and Maple's more outgoing tendencies that end up bringing the two together for the finale, as well as their respective abilities to allow them to neutralize the threat. And the book is also established not as a device for eliminating mystery or taking the tension out of plot lines, but as a tool to enhance them. While Dipper is at first wrong about the nature of the threat to Mabel's livelihood, the book isn't able to help him out, and winds up playing into his fears and mistrust because that's what he wants to find. It's a tool that can be misused as well as used properly, and this is an idea that's put into the audience's head from a very early point. The Legend of the Gobblewonker Eager to spend some quality time with his grandkids, Stan ropes Dipper and Mabel into a day fishing at the lake. But the Pines twins are more interested in the stories of Old Man McGucket, who claims there is a lake monster named the Gobblewonker destroying things. Everybody else, including Stan, dismisses this story, but Dipper and Mabel enlist the help of Seuss to get to the bottom of the story. They blow off their family to pursue the monster, hoping for a nice photo of it to win a contest, but the search comes up fruitless. That is, until the actual lake monster appears and chases them off the island. They're eventually chased into a cave, where the Gobblewonker is trapped before a falling rock shuts it down, as it was all along a mechanical being, piloted by Old Man McGucket so his son would pay attention to him. In the end, the Pines twins feel guilty over their exclusion of their great uncle, and they spend the rest of the day with him. One aspect of Gravity Falls that has given it the amount of praise and longevity that it still has today is the level of detail put into its world building and consistency from plot to plot. It's apparent in this episode, though only on a second watch through, how much forethought went into the series. As a few examples, Stan's car has a license plate that reads Stanley Mobile, foreshadowing his real name. Gideon makes an appearance on the back of the magazine Dipper's reading at the start of the episode. Blend and Blandin can also be seen in the background of this episode, as well as the previous one, though he's not introduced properly until eight episodes later. And of course, Old Man McGucket's proficiency for invention is introduced here as a gag, only to become a major plot point later in the series. As such, Gravity Falls is a type of show to heavily reward a careful viewer, the type of show that becomes more engaging the more effort is put into watching it and part of its success can be attributed to the fact that it calls attention to this aspect rather than keeping it hidden. Seeing all of this continuity encourages re-watching as well as engaging with communities online to see things you may have missed. This episode itself even had a fake screenshot put online which Slenderman edited into the background, one that caused many viewers to re-watch it so they could determine if it was real or not. And this sort of fine combing of background elements is an early glimpse into the later obsession it would foster in many of its fans. Headhunters Seuss stumbles upon a room of forgotten life-sized wax figures beneath the mystery shack and shows it to the Pines family. Mabel creates a wax figure of Grunkle Stan in order to commemorate the grand reopening of the Wax Museum of Mystery. The reopening is a success, though only due to a lie about free pizza being provided to the attendees, and Stan retires to his couch for the evening alongside the statue of himself. But a mystery arises when it's discovered that the wax statue has been decapitated and Dipper sets out to investigate, operating on the assumption that the attacker was motivated by anger at the wax museum's botched reopening. The investigation never finds success until it's learned that the real culprits were the statues themselves, angry about being mistreated for years and they were attempting to decapitate the real Stan Pines. So Mabel and Dipper team up to fight the cursed statues, and eventually succeed when Dipper lures their leader, Wax Sherlock Holmes, up to the roof as the sun rises. An interesting aspect of Gravity Falls that makes it so distinct relative to other mystery shows of its ilk is the inversion of the expected outcomes that many plotlines have. Typically, a supernatural element is introduced at the start of an episode, and it's slowly played up more and more until the ending, where it's revealed that there was a mundane, logical explanation for everything. The ghost haunting the mansion is really just a guy in a suit scaring teenagers. But in Gravity Falls, it's just as likely that a mundane plot about tracking down a wax figure vandal can turn out to be a supernatural phenomenon of cursed figures, as it can be a lake monster who turns out to be an animatronic ploy for an old man to spend more time with his son. 
It's not just an inversion of the typical animation cliches, but a step further by inverting the predictability of those plots insofar as the show isn't afraid to take a story in a riskier, less predictable direction in lieu of something that might be considered safe. This episode is one of the most proper introductions to the town of Gravity Falls in the show, as seen in Dipper and Mabel's investigations into the beheading suspect. As they go around the town, the general vibe is explored more and more. This is a town small and intimate enough that a wax statue being vandalized is enough to have the police mobilized, as well as to have a majority of the people show up to a single event and a list of suspects to be formed purely from people that you recognize at that event. The small town vibe of Gravity Falls gives a realistic reason for much of the recurring cast. Rather than a constant revolving door of new people, or a suspicious lack of outsiders and strangers to the plot, the same few people can serve the same few roles because of an understandable lack of anybody else to fill that existing role. The Hand That Rocks the Mabel the Pines twins seek to investigate Little Gideon, whose tent of telepathy serves as a direct competition to the Mystery Shack, although they can't help but find him harmless and no more of a con artist than their great uncle. But Gideon becomes enamored with the sight of Mabel and seeks out her affections, taking her on dates and using the pressure of the townsfolk to convince her to agree to more and more. But Mabel doesn't see the relationship that way and tries to let him down easily, though she finds no success until Dipper agrees to have the conversation for her. But rather than getting the message that Mabel isn't interested, he instead doubles down and decides that Dipper has deceived doubts into the mind of his bow. Now intent to destroy the Pines family, he lures Dipper into a trap and fights him with telekinetic powers, only for Mabel to catch him off guard and smash the amulet that granted those powers, as well as the hopes for their relationship. Meanwhile, Stan tries to tell off Gideon's father, Bud, about their family dating. But instead of an argument, the two begin writing up plans to merge their businesses for an even greater profit, only for the agreement to be called off when Gideon returns home from the A-plot. Gideon is introduced in this episode as a sort of anti-Pines family, existing as a foil and a recurring season 1 antagonist. While the town of Gravity Falls is a town inundated with fantastical and supernatural elements, these elements are shown more as tools than an inherent evil. Characters like Gideon, who misuse things like the journals for personal glory rather than a sense of wonder or curiosity, serve as an ideological opposite to Dipper. Likewise, while Mabel seeks out social interactions and affection from others, she does so by forming genuine bonds with them, while Gideon wants the same thing, but only so he can create a sort of dominance. One of the best ways to introduce a character is to introduce a polar opposite to them, or at least a negative influence over the same aspects of the world, so that the characters you learn about, in this case, the Pines family, can develop a set of traits and characteristics opposite those of the antagonist. And so a character like Gideon serves as more of a parallel to the Pines twins rather than an exact opposite. It isn't that he's completely different, it's that he's the kind of person who never quite had the same close familial relationships as Dipper or Mabel. Both characters are part of a familial con artist business. Both are adjacent to the supernatural elements of the setting, with the only thing separating them as how they interact with these elements and what they want out of them. If things had been slightly different, it's not unreasonable that Gideon could have turned out like the Pines twins or even vice versa. The Inconveniencing Dipper begins to develop a crush on Wendy, one of the other Mystery Shack employees, although he feels as though the relationship is doomed to be one-sided due to the age difference and the fact that he's not a teenager. And so when Wendy's older friends come around to hang out, Dipper invites himself and Mabel along so he can spend more time with Wendy and prove to her that he's not a child. The group goes to a condemned corner store, where the couple who ran it, the Duskertons, were allegedly murdered before the place shut down. They mess around in the store for a while before eventually, Dipper starts to fear that something is haunting the store, although he's too afraid of being ridiculed by his new friends to say anything until the Duskerton ghosts begin capturing and punishing the group one by one, although Mabel is incapacitated due to overeating expired candy mix. It's not until Dipper pieces together that the ghosts hate teenagers that he steps up to defuse the situation by announcing that he's really 12 years old and doing a childish dance to prove it. The couple let their captives go and everything is returned to normal, with Dipper and Wendy finding a new respect for one another. 
Thematically, the town of Gravity Falls is meant to represent the childhoods of Dipper and Mabel. Their canon birthdays are on the last day of summer break, and, being both 12 years old, their time in Gravity Falls overlaps with the last few weeks of their childhood. And so one thing that pops up throughout the show is the duo trying to contend with the idea of their impending teenagerdom, and whether holding on to or rejecting the gift of that last period of childhood innocence is worth doing. Both twins have differing ideas on how to approach this subject. Mabel is actively embracing the part of her that's childish, with the looming threat of adulthood being something she chooses to ignore in order to live in the moment. Dipper, on the other hand, cannot wait to be a full-fledged adult, and actively resents being viewed as a child. But through the series, he starts to learn that the sense of adventure and wonder is something that can fade with time, and as such, he must learn to appreciate it while it's still there. But for now, this subject is something that exists more so in the realm of subtext, meant to accentuate plots rather than to be the basis of them. The difference between the two twins in this way doesn't create any lasting conflicts between the two until much later in the show, but it's still something that forms as early as this episode, giving the finale of the show a much stronger impact as it's the culmination of ideas that have existed since the very start. Dipper vs. Manliness After embarrassing himself at a video game strength testing machine, Dipper declares his intentions to become more manly, although he isn't quite sure what this entails. So he goes into the woods where a Manotaur detects his strife and decides to teach the boy about being a man. Dipper baits the Manotaur tribe into teaching him what they know, and soon he's put through a series of toughness trials. The final trial for him to undergo involves fighting and beheading a multi-bear, which is exactly what it sounds like. But when Dipper defeats it and prepares to detach one of its heads, he learns that the bear likes the same songs as him, and the two form a bond. Dipper returns to the Manotaurs after refusing to slay the bear, and they deem him unmanly for refusing their challenge. Although in the end, Grunkle Stan declares that doing the right thing, even if it's unpopular, is more manly than anything. This is after Mabel has spent the entire episode trying to get her great uncle more in touch with his sensitive side, so he can ask out his crush, Lazy Susan, working at the local diner. But when she fails to soften him up, she instead sells Susan the idea of the guy as a fixer-upper. The two plots of this episode are opposites, one of Dipper trying to find happiness by being more manly, and one from Stan trying to find happiness by being less so. Manliness in this context being something so nebulously defined that it may as well not exist for all the potential interpretations. Dipper wants more of it, and Stan wants less, and so it's viewed as something you only desire when it's something you don't have. As such, the message at the end of the episode plays into this. Dipper wants to become more manly until he passes the final trial, at which point he realizes that that manliness is worthless if it isn't bringing you happiness or any sort of satisfaction with your life. If your only desire is to fit in with other people, then you'll likely end up fitting into whatever group thinks it can get the most out of you. Dipper only wants to fit in with the Manotaurs, as they seem to have something that he doesn't. And yet all they want out of him is to slay the multi-bear out of some personal grudge against the beast. And so Dipper rejects an ideology that exists purely to perpetuate itself. Manliness for the sake of being manly is worthless. It's better to be tough for the sake of standing up for yourself and others, rather than to fit in. Double Dipper Stan throws a party in order to attract kids and their money to the Mystery Shack, and while they're setting up for that party, Dipper and Mabel discover that Stan's copier machine can also clone people. When Mabel is asked to man the ticket booth with Wendy, she laments that she's not able to go out and make new friends, so Dipper volunteers to take her place in order to get closer to his crush. But Wendy ends up ditching her post to go to the party anyway, and so Dipper uses the cloning machine to make a second him, so that he can enact an elaborate plan to win Wendy's heart. But as his plan gets more and more complicated, Dipper continuously makes more clones of himself until, in typical sci-fi fashion, the clones overthrow him for not sticking to the earlier plans. In the end, Dipper spends too much time fighting the other Dippers to spend any time with Wendy, and they all lose out on the night with her. He concludes from this that perhaps he shouldn't get so hung up on plans in the future. Meanwhile, Mabel takes the dance floor in an attempt to impress her new friends, Grinda and Candy, by beating the most popular girl in town in a dance-off. She fails to win over the crowd, largely because she's unable to threaten them into support, 
but does manage to win over her new friends despite this. Dipper learns to let loose and relax in this episode, largely through spending time with others instead of getting in his own head about things. We see this play out by seeing the comparison between him and, well, hims. Some of the Dippers stay reclusive and plan amongst themselves, while the real Dipper, Dipper Classic, goes out and tries to plans out firsthand, only to see their weakness. By going out into the world and gaining firsthand experience, Dipper is able to grow and mature beyond the more analytical recluse he would have become had he kept to himself. A type of recluse who would grow to resent the more outgoing and adaptive person he could have been. Dipper gets along well with the clones of himself right up until the point where he realizes that he needs to change. Since that desire to change is a direct challenge to the older versions of him, they take offense and attack. This episode is also our first look at Pacifica Northwest, a secondary antagonist for the Pines twins to deal with. While Gideon is somebody who has more knowledge of the mystical side of Gravity Falls, Pacifica is the representation of the mundane. Her animosity towards the twins comes as a part of their dealings with social situations and human interaction. It takes much longer before she gets any proper development though, so I'll leave the section on her character for then. For now, she exists as more of a plot device than a proper character, something we'll see built upon in the following episode. Irrational Treasure The town is celebrating Pioneer Day, where everybody reenacts Gravity Falls as it was during the year it was founded. During the festivities, Pacifica Northwest, who is the great-granddaughter of the town's founder, denigrates Mabel for her silliness, saying that she's incapable of taking the festivities seriously enough. And so to make his sister feel better by taking Pacifica down a peg, Dipper decides to investigate a fact he read in Journal 3, that the Northwest family did not really found Gravity Falls. Thanks to Mabel's shenanigans, their investigation leads them to an underground vault where they learn the truth. The town was founded by the eighth and a half president, Quentin Trimbley, who was such a national embarrassment that his existence was covered up and the honor of founding Gravity Falls was given to a local buffoon instead. But some shadowy force doesn't want them to learn of this cover-up, and the police take them into custody. Let out only when Quentin's body is thawed from a peanut brittle block and, as he's technically the acting president, orders the mystery twins pardoned and freed. Gravity Falls is, at its core, a silly show. It's targeted towards children, having aired on Disney's networks, and more or less tries to appeal to that demographic in everything. And while there are a lot of themes and jokes that only get picked up on by adults, as well as many ciphers and tertiary puzzles to keep fans engaged outside the show that may go over the heads of some of the younger fans, at the end of it all, Gravity Falls is not a show that takes itself extremely seriously, and it doesn't necessarily demand that the audience does either. Approaching it as though it's a masterwork of deeper meaning as esoteric as it is profound is fundamentally missing the point. The plots are silly, the characters are silly, and if you aren't indulging in the lighthearted fun of the episode-to-episode -episode plots, then you're actually missing out on just as much of the experience as a person who engages with the work exclusively to find the hidden messages. Gravity Falls is not the kind of show that demands that its audience create a two-hour video essay picking it apart nor is it the kind of show that's so shallow that such a thing cannot be done, either. The end goal of the episode is to show that the silliness of a character like Mabel, combined with the enthusiasm for the fantastic of a character like Dipper, is ultimately what makes up the broad appeal that the show has to offer. There's no one correct interpretation of the show, you have to take the individual parts together to appreciate it fully. The Time Traveler's Pig the Mystery Shack is holding a fair, and Dipper spends the time with Wendy, enjoying each other's company until he accidentally hits her in the eye with the baseball. While trying to get ice for her injury, Robbie comes by and treats it with a snow cone before asking her out. Dipper mopes for the rest of the afternoon, but Mabel has a great time, winning a pig which she names Waddles. But when Dipper meets a time traveler, Blendon Blandon, who says he's there to investigate a series of time anomalies, he gets the idea to travel back in time and redo the throw that injured Wendy, so she doesn't end up with Robbie. After a series of failures, he eventually enlists the help of Mabel to get his happy ending, but this comes at the cost of Pacifica Northwest winning the pig instead. They fight over which timeline they should stay in, before eventually Dipper caves in and allows Wendy to date Robbie so Mabel can get back Waddles. 
In the end, Waddles is able to embarrass Robbie to give Dipper a satisfying conclusion after all, and Blendon Blandon is made to fix all the time anomalies set during the previous episodes. This is probably the moment that made the most people want to go back and rewatch earlier Gravity Falls episodes. While a few of the more keen-eyed observers certainly recognized Blendon from his subtle cameo appearances, as well as popping up in the theme song, this is the point where all of that pays off. And because this is a payoff episode, it also distracts from potential looks into the future that may fly under people's noses. Ford makes an early appearance in this episode. It was originally planned that he would have six fingers shown on his hand, but that was considered to be too obvious by the showrunners, and so his hands are off-screen instead. For mysteries, it's best to write the line of subtlety so that viewers are never completely able to recognize when something is given away, or what details are meant to be important. But in addition to dropping subtle plot hints, such as Blendon's camo outfit teasing later episode set pieces, this episode also plays into many of the thematic moments of later episodes. Dipper ultimately chooses to sacrifice something he wants for the betterment of his sister's life. The damage caused by supernatural elements of the town can always be mitigated as long as we maintain a close relationship with those nearest to us. One other thing that comes up in this episode, as well as the previous, is showing off massive forces beyond the explanation of the show up to that point, that don't get built upon in the moment, leading to a general feeling that there's a much greater set of conspiracies than what we're ever exposed to. Moments like this lead to a feeling that each episode is building up to something, as there are always more unanswered questions than answers, and the audience will want more. Fight Fighters After an argument over Wendy, Robbie challenges Dipper to a fight, and he fears for his life as Dipper knows he can't fight somebody older than him, or anybody at all for that matter. While panicking on what to do, he finds an old cheat code carved into an arcade machine that brings the royalty-free fighting game character Rumble McSkirmish to life. And so rather than fighting Robbie himself, Dipper plans to have Rumble fight for him, and lies that Robbie slew his father to rile up the fighter. But when the fight actually happens, Rumble begins actually beating up Robbie with the intent to finish him, and so Dipper has to stop the rampaging video game character. In the end, the only way to satiate the fighter's lust for violence is by admitting that he lied and then accepting his impending doom at the hands of Rumble. But after Dipper is beat up, Rumble fades into nothing as the game is now over. Ultimately, when Wendy sees the carnage and announces her hatred of violence, the two boys lie about their intentions and declare a Cold War truce, where they simply hate each other in silence. Meanwhile, Mabel tries to cure Stan of a newfound fear of heights by luring him to the water tower, only for that tower to be damaged during the fighting, which cures his fear through exposure. A very self-aware episode of Gravity Falls, this story comes with a moral about how lying to avoid or circumvent conflict can lead to much more harm than simply accepting the consequences up front. Dipper is derided for not doing the manly thing by fighting Robbie outright, preferring to cower like a wimp, the show's own language, and ends up lying to Rumble about his backstory to get the fighter to battle for him. But had he told the truth from the start, there could have been a lot of collateral damage avoided, including Dipper having to fight a professional instead of some random teenager. But immediately after this lesson is learned, Dipper and Robbie put aside their differences to mutually lie to Wendy about where all the carnage came from, claiming that they both hate fighting instead of telling the truth up front. Where most shows would have gone for a moral of some kind where Dipper is honest and proclaims to improve himself, we immediately get a comedic beat of him instantly forgetting his lesson. This episode is ultimately a filler episode, not really one to push the plot forward in a directly meaningful way, but largely existing to establish the relationship between Robbie and Dipper following the Time Traveler's Pig. It's fitting that a major part of the episode comes from the world of an arcade-style fighting game, with such lines as, you killed my father again, it plays into the repetitive and ultimately pointless nature of it all. Not that this is necessarily a bad thing. It's fine for an episode to explore the characters or to simply tell a story without being directly plot relevant. And so an episode every so often that lets the audience cool off of a constant elevation of stakes is a much needed refuge. Little Dipper Mabel is revealed to be a millimeter taller than Dipper and she spends the afternoon making fun of him for it. 
Upset at this, Dipper sets out to find something paranormal that can make him taller, and comes across crystals that, when light is refracted through, can grow or shrink objects. He creates a flashlight out of the crystals, and uses this to try to get an edge over Mabel, but when the two begin fighting over the flashlight, it's discovered by Gideon, who uses it to shrink Mabel and Dipper in order to hold them hostage. But when Stan doesn't respond to his threats, he decides to simply shrink Stan and take the shack for himself. Mabel and Dipper are able to beat him to the shack, but when they're about to grow to their usual size, Dipper begins arguing with Mabel over whether she'll regrow him to his original height, or let him keep the extra height he gained from the flashlight. This argument prevents them from rescuing Stan in time, and when confronted about it later, Dipper admits that he felt he was being made fun of too much for the height difference, to which Mabel responds that it's the only thing she really had over her brother. In the end, they team up one more time to disable Gideon before he can shrink Stan, and the two grow back to their original size, with the issue beneath them. Thematically, this episode plays into many of the morals that Gravity Falls routinely uses through its run. A paranormal device is misused for personal gain, and it can't be set right until the family puts some kind of argument behind them. As such, this episode is a standalone interpretation of the show at large. Even in smaller ways, it shows off character motives and personalities. Dipper begins the episode's plot by being insecure, but rather than this being viewed as a fault exclusive to him, it's instead presented as something mutual between the Pines twins. Mabel, it was just as insecure over Dipper rubbing it in that he's smarter than she is. So it's less so that one character is in the wrong, and more so that both characters need to grow. This is a much more satisfying way to do character development, as it makes it feel like less of a personal responsibility to grow, and more of a thing that people can work on together. Isolation only makes you more distant from others. What's also revealed in this episode is a much less interpersonal conflict. Namely, that Gideon's desire to take over the Mystery Shack is less a grudge, and more a desire for power. He knows there's something greater at play behind the scenes, and wants not only to crush the Pines family for opposing him, but for being in his way. And so an episode that sets itself up as being about the interpersonal relationships of the show can also surprise the audience by having something much more tangible revealed. Summer Ween It's Summer Ween, Halloween in summer, because Gravity Falls loves celebrating it so much, and because it'd be strange to air a Halloween special in a show that takes place over the course of a single summer. The Mystery Twins are preparing to celebrate, but when Dipper finds out that Wendy is going to a party and that she thinks trick-or-treating is childish, he decides to skip going out with Mabel and her friends to go to the party with Wendy instead. But they're stopped by the Summerween Trickster, a monster who attacks children who don't have the seasonal spirit, who demands 500 pieces of candy from the group, or he'll eat them. They set out to collect the bounty and have fun doing it, but ultimately fail when Dipper accidentally destroys the candy, trying not to look childish in front of Wendy. The Summerween Trickster then comes to collect and chases the group into a costume store, where he eats Zeus before cornering the others. But just as he's about to finish them off, he collapses, as Zeus eats him from the inside. In the end, it's revealed that the trickster formed out of all of the collected rejected candy, and being eaten and appreciated by somebody was all he ever wanted, so he dies happy. In the B-plot, Stan tries and fails to scare two kids, and fears he's losing his touch. But when the kids break into his house to collect candy and see him preparing to shower, they run off in fear, and he celebrates the victory. In this episode, we see Mabel lamenting that she wasn't able to spend one final Halloween trick-or-treating with her brother, that they'd be too old the following year, and the tradition would be lost to the inevitable flow of time, as well as the desire to grow up. As the town of Gravity Falls exists as a metaphor for the childhood of the two main characters, we can see the fear that the two are going to lose at special something they had, showing itself in how each character views their childhood. Mabel isn't just clinging onto her childhood innocence and a desire to avoid growing up, but she's holding on to her connections to the town of Gravity Falls, as she fears that growing up also means abandoning things she associates with a happy childhood, such as her relationship to her brother. Likewise, we often see Dipper rejecting the more mundane aspects of the town of Gravity Falls, only to inevitably go back to the way things were when these get in the way of spending time with his sister. And so Summerween as an episode and a holiday exists as a sort of last hurrah, a moment for the twins to celebrate their childlike tendencies while it's still acceptable to do so. 
Mabel might have trouble moving on, but it's an issue that she doesn't have to worry about for now. And Dipper might be too eager to move on, but likewise, it's an issue that she shouldn't have to worry about for now. Boss Mabel Tired of Stan's iron fist when running the Mystery Shack, Mabel makes a bet with her great-grandfather as to whether she could run the business with kindness rather than he could run it his way. So they agree that if Stan makes more money on his vacation than the Pines family can make without him, Mabel will become the new boss for good. Things are off to a good start for Mabel when she lets others have input, but it turns out Seuss's ideas are too far-fetched to actually work, Wendy is too lazy to do anything without being forced to, and Dipper's idea of using real paranormal creatures as attractions only succeeds in scarring guests. Ultimately, Mabel is forced to take more after Stan in order to get things accomplished, and soon, the Mystery Shack is profitable again. Although, after all the damage dealt, they only succeed in being profitable by a single dollar. Meanwhile, Stan was on a game show where his conman way succeeded in giving him a large prize, only for him to bet it all on the final puzzle and lose because he couldn't say the word please. But when he returns and announces his victory, Mabel decides to give up the prize and let her uncle stay as boss, as she didn't like the person she had to become to run the mystery shack. Grunkle Stan is not a good person. He lies, cheats, and enjoys watching others suffer. Despite this, his antics are always portrayed positively despite the clear negative effect that they can have on those around him. For the most part, this is due to the light-hearted nature of the show. His antics never cause any permanent harm, and so they can be excused. But also, he gets away with a lot because there are far worse and more interesting things going on around him. Ultimately, his only real goal so far is to make as much money as possible. At least, this is what we're told is his proper motivation until much later. It's interesting to go back and see how the narrative is able to take a much more light-hearted approach to his antics while denouncing the similar behavior of somebody like Gideon. It's practically a giveaway that he's later going to receive some sort of tragic justification for his actions. But for now, he comes across as an ill-intentioned but ultimately harmless individual, standing in contrast to the children under his care, such as Mabel. While her approach to listening to her employees and treating them as friends is an optimistic one, it's also an approach that only works when things are running smoothly. The second something goes wrong, it takes a sterner, more experienced hand to correct those issues, and nobody has more experience with things going terribly wrong than Stanley Pines. Bottomless Pit The Pines family and Seuss are disposing of unwanted things by throwing them into a bottomless pit. But a gust of wind blows them into that pit, and they begin falling to their... they begin falling. In order to pass the time before presumably starving to death, they take turns telling stories. The first story is voiceover told by Dipper. In it, he feels self-conscious when his voice is made fun of by his friends, and so he goes to Old Man McGucket, who promises him a potion that will change his voice. The potion works, but despite having a voice worthy of TV commercial voiceovers, doesn't bring him any happiness as it causes his family not to recognize him and crowds to chase him. In the end, the potion wears off and he rejects the offer to get a new permanent voice, giving the rejected potion to Grunkle Stan instead. The second story is Seuss's really great pinball story is that a good title do they have to be puns or whatever? Told by Seuss. Seuss is trying to set a pinball high score and is convinced to cheat by Mabel and Dipper. He succeeds, but the machine grows angry that he tilted the machine and sucks the trio into the game, where the giant skull at the front plans to torment them for their dishonesty. But Seuss, knowing how the machine works, plans to disable it from the inside so they can be free. Yet when he's near the power button, he hesitates, as shutting down the machine would also erase his high score, which is one of his only accomplishments. In the end, he decides to erase the score in order to save the trio, so his new greatest accomplishment can be saving his friends. Then, Grunkle Stan tells a story, but it's self-indulgent enough not to get an intro card. Finally, Mabel tells a story called Truth Ache. Mabel is upset at Stan's constant lying and deceiving others, so she searches through Dipper's journals in order to find something that will make him more honest. She comes across a pair of dentures that force the wearer to only say the truth, and she slips it into his mouth while he's asleep. But the new, truthful Grunkle tells the truth all the time, even when it's inconvenient or unwanted, and soon the kids are traumatized at the horrible things he keeps saying without his usual filter. 
Eventually, his truth-telling gets him in trouble with the law, and Mabel is forced to lie on his behalf in order to set things right. In the end, she decides it's too much of a hassle to have a truth-telling grunkle, and she destroys the teeth by throwing them into a bottomless pit, which is where the episode begins. It ends when the group finally reaches the pit's bottom, which also happens to be its top, and they're placed back at the entrance to the pit, with no time having passed. They make a mutual agreement to never speak of the incident again. The Deep End The Pines family heads to the local pool on the hottest day of the summer to cool off. There, Dipper learns that Wendy is a lifeguard and that there's a position open for assistant lifeguard. So he goes to the neurotic head lifeguard to get the position, only for his rule breaking to draw his ire, and eventually winds up with the task of finding out who's been stealing pool supplies to retain his job. This turns out to be Mabel, who met a merman named Mermondo, trapped in the pool, and they fell in love, ultimately deciding to commandeer the supplies to help him escape, where he can go free to reunite with his family. Dipper tries to stop her from stealing the supplies, but when he learns that she's doing it to free someone she loves, he relents and accepts that he'll lose his job to make his sister happy. While all of this is going on, Gideon and Stan feud over a seat by the pool that results in Stan getting glued to the seat after camping out overnight. An overlooked thing this episode does is switching the typical formula many Gravity Falls episodes have thus far used. Typically, Dipper is the one to go off on some sort of paranormal investigation, while Mabel obsesses over a social relationship, only for the two plots to converge later. But here, Dipper obsesses over Wendy and tries to spend more time with her, while Mabel's is the plot that focuses on some paranormal aspect of the town. But despite this flip in the sibling dynamic, their relationship remains unchanged. No matter what, Dipper and Mabel end each episode putting their differences aside and doing what's best for them both, instead of helping out one twin at the expense of the other. A plot like this merely shows that, were the situation reversed, the same thing would happen. The only consistent thing between them is their love for one another, so the end result will always turn out positive, as long as that lesson is never forgotten. But another thing that gets flipped in this episode, or rather that shows a different side, is the paranormal aspects of Gravity Falls itself. Rather than the abnormal being a thing that can cause damage and can't be trusted, the only paranormal thing in this episode is Marmondo, and he's a nice person stuck in a bad situation. The mundane parts of Gravity Falls are the more absurd and frankly dangerous parts, like pool checks and sane behavior, or that the feud between Gideon and Stan is entirely through petty squabbling instead of supernatural terror. In the end, despite being a seemingly unremarkable episode, the deep end has a surprising deep end, pun intended. Carpet DM Dipper grows annoyed at Mabel for inviting her friends over to their room every night and wishes he could move out. When Seuss discovers a new room in the house, the two twins both announce their desire to move into it, which Stan detects as an opportunity to make the two feud. He decides that whoever sucks up to him the most will get the key to the room, and the two begin making themselves miserable for it. But when Dipper and Mabel are arguing in the room later, they wind up discovering that the carpet can switch the minds of whoever builds up enough static on it when they switch bodies. But rather than immediately switching back, Dipper and Mabel decides to use the opportunity to sabotage the other's chances at winning by harassing Stan. But when Dipper, Mabel, gets taken by Mabel's friends for another sleepover, and Stan pulls Mabel, Dipper, aside for a man-to-man -man talk, Mabel Dipper's attempts at insulting her great uncle backfire as he views it as Dipper finally standing up to him and gives him, her, the key. But Mabel Dipper realizes that Dipper, Mabel, can't get the room if they never switch back and barricades him, herself, inside only for Dipper, Mabel, to use her friends to barge in and take it back. But all this accomplishes is getting more people into the mind switching carpet before ultimately they all scuffled into their original bodies. This includes Seuss and Waddles, who swap early on and get into an incident where Old Man McGucket tries to eat Seuss and Waddles ends up finding true love. At the end of the episode, Dipper reveals that he only wanted the room because he felt like he didn't belong, as Mabel kept inviting her friends to their space and he ends up giving the room to Seuss instead. As close as the twins are, they still have enough distinct differences as to loathe the time that they spend as one another. 
And so despite this episode having a happy ending where the two reaffirm their bond to prove that they really do love each other after all, this episode is still one that highlights their differences. So the moral taught in this episode is one that's only really taught to the audience. Dipper and Mabel are two characters who don't really need their relationship to develop. As far as sibling relationships go, they're still two very close characters who know to downplay each other's faults and work together. If something is going to come between them, it's going to be something new, so instead of learning a lesson, it's all about adaptation to a new situation. And this ends up giving a nice form of pacing to the series overall. Gravity Falls is an abnormal place, and so plots get to be about the characters learning to adapt and fit into the strangeness that's going on around them. And because the Mystery Twins are also learning to adapt to changes in their relationship, this makes the show thematically consistent, whether it's world building or focusing on character drama. Boys Crazy Mabel and her friends are excited to see the boy band several times, even though Dipper and Wendy denounce the genre as artificial. But when the concert is sold out, they decide to sneak backstage to see the boys anyway, and they learn that the band is actually a group of clones designed to sell concert tickets and music. So Mabel frees the boy band and lets them live in the attic until the producer stops hunting them down and it's safe to leave. But even after that point, she's grown too attached to her new pet boy band to let them go into the woods and lies to them about the safety of the world outside her bedroom. But after driving away her friends and becoming more controlling than their old boss, she begins to feel guilty about the whole ordeal. In the end, she frees several times and they wander into the woods, presumably to get eaten. Elsewhere, Dipper hears an argument between Wendy and Robbie that gets diffused when Wendy's boyfriend plays a song he claims to have written. But closer analysis of this song by the duo of Dipper and Stan reveals that it contains a hidden message that hypnotizes Wendy into falling for Robbie. He reveals the deception to Wendy, and she breaks up with Robbie in a fit, but Dipper tries to ask her out immediately after, and is shot down for being equally insensitive. Throughout the show, Mabel has constantly wanted to find a summer romance, although every time we see her find one, it's cut short by some outside influence. In this episode, she finally has a captive romance and refuses to let it go, even if it's really healthy to do so. The fact that her point of obsession is a group of guys who she just recently learned were clones and thus barely real people only reinforces the idea that Mabel was never really interested in a summer romance, but the idea of one. And so his Dipper. His efforts to expose Robbie's manipulation come across as less of a thing done in the interest of keeping a friend safe, and more so, an action performed to be the grand gesture that will make her fall for him. Dipper is obsessed more with the idea of Wendy than with the girl herself. Although Alex Hirsch has clarified later that the actual subliminal message was not something that was actually hypnotizing Wendy. She actually really liked the song, and Dipper digging too far into the hidden meaning just happened to uncover the original band's backwards message. The moral was about being truthful with intentions, rather than some sort of manipulation on Robbie's account, but it wasn't completely clear within the episode itself. Still, the overall message about romance for the sake of yourself, rather than the other person, still holds true as something Dipper perhaps should have worked on. Land Before Swine Mabel steps out of the house in order to buy something and leaves Stan in charge of watching Waddles, but Stan, not a fan of the pig, leaves it outside so he can continue running his business, only for it to get eaten by the creature Dipper and Seuss have been hunting. They all convene and prepare to hunt down the monster that took Waddles, with Stan lying about the fact that he put Waddles outdoor to absolve himself from guilt in the whole situation. They track the pig to a cave beneath an abandoned church, full of dinosaurs that have been preserved in tree sap for all the years. Stan realizes it would make a good attraction, and voices his pleasure at having left Waddles outside, as it led to him discovering this new place. But Mabel overhears this and decides she's never going to talk to her grunkle again. At the same time, Dipper snaps at Seuss for breaking their lantern and losing the trail, as he had previously destroyed the photos Dipper took of the dinosaur, and announces that he's sick of the mechanic's incompetence. But all of that is put on hold when they finally track down Waddles, and wind up stranded with a newly hatched baby dino in the process. A dino who eats Old Man McGucket. He was there too. It's not until they put their differences aside and prove their value to the group that everyone is able to escape together, and the episode ends with everyone getting along again. Also, McGucket ate his way out of the baby dinosaur. 
It's somewhat of a tired trope, but this episode leans into characters undoing several episodes of neglect with the grand gesture that shows that they really do care. It always feels a bit tiresome when a character has to be pushed to some sort of extreme before they start behaving in a way that makes them come across as worth being around. The way Stan behaved that made Mabel refuse to talk to him is the way that he acts a majority of the time, and the actions he took to rescue Waddles were the uncharacteristic part of his personality. And while it's possible to say that punching a dinosaur while wearing a pig is the kind of thing he does when stress forces him to reveal who he really is deep down, it would be better if it didn't take some kind of life-threatening event for him to finally respect Mabel's once. So, can one good deed undo a pattern of behavior that ultimately causes harm? If it's represented as a split between the amount of harm an individual is doing versus the amount of good they do, then it comes out as even. A great big good thing can balance out many small bad things. And ultimately, this is why the trope comes up so often in media. It balances. When balance is achieved, the status quo can be maintained. It's just a bit of a shame that Gravity Falls can fall into this cliché, as it's a show that's normally very good at keeping the plot moving at an engaging pace. Dreamscaperers Unable to get the deed to the Mystery Shack, Gideon resorts to using supernatural means to invade Stan's memories so he can get the safe combination. He summons a being named Bill Cipher and makes a deal with him to steal the memory from Stan's mind in exchange for some unnamed price. But Seuss and Mabel overhear this deal being made, and they rush to warn Dipper so the trio can enter Stan's mind and find the memory first. But Dipper has some reservations about helping out, as he's unsure whether it's worth it to save a man who's always so cruel to him. Once in their grunkle's head, they split up, as Dipper wants to know what Stan truly thinks of him, and he ends up overhearing part of a memory that makes it seem as though his suspicions were true. Meanwhile, Seuss and Mabel manage to track down a memory of Stan entering the safe combination, only for Bill to have been one step ahead of them the entire time. They're trapped by Bill, who uses his powers to attack Seuss and Mabel with their worst nightmares. Meanwhile, Dipper hears the rest of the memory, that Stan was only really acting so tough on him to toughen him up, as he reminds Stan of himself at that age. Reinvigorated to protect his grunkle, Dipper realizes that he can use his imagination as a weapon, as they're inside somebody's mind, and the trio fight back against Bill. Bill's impressed by their tenacity, and claims that they're too useful to defeat then and there, and he leaves them alone. But then, Stan wakes up to the sound of an explosion, as it turns out that, while they were all distracted, Gideon simply blasted the safe open with dynamite. With the deed now in his hands, he orders the destruction of the mystery shack, and the episode ends on that cliffhanger. Bill Cipher is ultimately the main antagonist of Gravity Falls, even if his appearances in the first season are extremely limited. While he only shows up in the flesh, sort of, during this episode, his appearance is alluded to multiple times throughout the first season, whenever the Eye of Providence appears on screen. As this symbol is adjacent to several real-world conspiracy theories, its inclusion in a show with so much occult symbolism isn't something that would have much attention drawn to it in the first place, and as such, any foreshadowing of him could have been dismissed as general spookiness by the showrunners. And so when he does finally appear, it makes all the earlier iterations seem like he was hiding in plain sight all along, which, considering his grand ambition that I'll cover later, adds to his characterization before we even know the guy. The end of this episode is also rather fitting in the sense that despite all the esoteric occultism throughout the show thus far, the real thing that the Pines family had to worry about came down to a mundane application of explosives. We're led to believe for so long that Gideon's threat comes from his possession of the second journal, but in the end, the Pines family is blindsided by his intrusion just as much as the audience is. Gideon Rises Gideon now controls the Mystery Shack and is planning to construct Gideon Land on top of it, but he divulges his real motivation in private to his father, that he wants to control the shack so he can search the area for the other journal, as he has journal number two. Dipper and Mabel make one last plan to assault him and take the deed to the Mystery Shack back, recruiting the gnomes from the first episode to fight him for it. But Gideon is one step ahead and turns the gnomes against the twins, managing to steal the other book in the process. Mabel and Tipper are sent back home to live with their parents in defeat, when Gideon finds out that the journal he took was actually number 3, and that there must still be a journal 1. So he gets into a giant Gideon bot to hunt down the twins, who he assumes must still have it. Their chase leads them to the top of a cliff, where Dipper is able to fight him without the use of the book, careening them all to the ground below. 
The townsfolk come to investigate the ruckus, and Gideon turns them against the twins, claiming that they assaulted him, and the police move in to arrest. But at the last moment, Stan arrives with news and proof that Gideon has been spying on them for years, and his psychic powers are fraudulent. The fake psychic is arrested, and the deed returns to the hands of the Pines family, along with the journals. In the end, Dipper decides to tell the truth about the journal to Stan, that he's been finding out about the paranormal through it, but Stan seems not to believe it and takes the book for himself, hoping to get some ideas for attractions. He takes it into a room underneath the mystery shack, and puts it together with the remaining journals where he's finally able to complete the schematics for a mysterious machine. This episode ends the first season and takes with it a lot of the more traditionally kid-friendliness that defined the show out of necessity. Gideon was a dangerous person, but more so because of his personality. When it came to his control over the paranormal, he was no more skilled than Dipper was, his downfall coming about due to greed and assuming that the books were the only strength his foes had. But in the following season, the obstacles start to have a higher threat level. Instead of a vague notion of what threats may be at hand, the Pines family must instead deal with people who know exactly what they're doing. But this escalation shouldn't come as a big surprise. Gideon was a regular villain for the Pines family, and his removal as a force in the show means that something or someone has to take his place. And in the interest of keeping escalating scale of threats to make a show retain interest, the higher stakes we see in the upcoming season are a necessity. It just plays into the skill of the showrunners that it came across as natural instead of forced. Season 1 It's ordinarily much easier to do a breakdown of an individual season of a TV show as the break in between seasons is often used by the writers to analyze what worked and what didn't. If there's a particular chemistry between characters that didn't get picked up on until partway through a season, it would be noticed and played up in the following one. And if there's something that audiences complain about and wanted to see less of, it would be reduced following the complaints. Most shows in their first season go through a discovery period where the staff working on the show has to figure out what it is that they're doing well and how they can build upon that. But even from an early point, Gravity Falls was a show that had a lot of its later aspects very thoroughly planned out. Characters with no role to serve in the narrative weren't added when they were needed. They were planned from the start to serve the role they had, with their exclusion being more to build suspense and mystery than because they didn't serve a role to the plot. Not that season 1 had much of a plot in the first place. While there's a lot of build-up and establishing moments for the characters in setting, the overall way that things develop from one episode to the next doesn't really lend itself to a long synopsis, with episodes being largely self-contained stories. So the real difference between the first and second seasons of Gravity Falls comes down less to anything external to the show, and more of a conscious internal decision to divide it into a build-up and cool-down split. Season 1 is adding fuel, Season 2 lights it aflame. That said, there are a few things that are built upon in Season 2 that are a response less so to the showrunners learning about their work, and more because of fan reactions and desires. The canon of the show is played pretty loose outside the bounds of the show itself, with Alex Hirsch regularly confirming or denying, usually the former, random theories and character quirks. And season 2 continues this trend in a more concrete capacity by building on character relationships as directed by what the audience desired more. Again, these are still things that flow logically from how season 1 set up the pieces, just given an amount of attention that was more to quiet the audience than tell the intended story. Karaoke. The Pines are preparing to celebrate getting their business back and defeating Gideon by throwing a big party. But Stan is also busy putting together the last few pieces of the puzzle after copying the third journal. He powers up the machine made from the combined schematics, which alerts the attention of two government agents, Powers and Trigger. When the agents arrive on the doorstep of the mystery shack, Stan is terrified that they may find out his secrets, but Dipper is ecstatic that he can finally get some help piecing together the mysteries of the town, only for Stan to once again declare that the whole supernatural thing is fake and made up to drum up business. So Dipper takes matters into his own hands and resurrects the dead in order to prove to the agents that everything in the journal is real, which works too well as a zombie invasion soon attacks the shack is back party, ruining Mabel's hopes of doing family karaoke. But when the shack is overrun by the undead, the family becomes trapped inside, only for Stan to come out with the bat to defend his family from the horde. 
He reveals that he's known of the supernatural phenomenon all along, and merely lied about it to stop Dipper from investigating things that could lead to harm. When a black light from the party shines on the third journal, invisible ink shows up, revealing that there's an entire second half of the book with more information about the zombies, namely, that they can be destroyed by three-part harmonies, and Mabel gets her wish as the family's karaoke is able to defeat the Horde. After the mess, the agents from before declare their intentions to ramp up the investigation, while Stan and Dipper both lie to each other about their future intentions with the journal. The second season brings with it a series of changes best signified by the invisible ink on the third journal itself, being able to revisit early concepts and ideas with a brand new perspective as more information is available. And the increase in stakes comes with an increase in the paranoia from the original author. Shifting to invisible ink to prevent anybody threatening from reading the entries shows not only that he's fearing being watched, but that something capable of inspiring that fear is on the horizon. This episode also introduces a new source of conflict to the ambitions of the Pines family through the investigating government agents Power and Trigger. And while these two largely only appear as background elements in future episodes, the fact that the antagonistic force replacing Gideon this season is immediately set up as a group of government agents instantly adds a sense of ambiguity to the show's morality. While Gideon was unequivocally a bad guy, the agents are merely investigating something that's rightfully dangerous and worth investigating. So for people trying to do the right thing to oppose Stan's ambitions, raises questions as to whether what he's doing is worthy of the audience's support. Into the Bunker Dipper plans to ask out Wendy, but can't build up the nerve to do so, and asks her on a mystery investigation with Seuss and Mabel instead. That investigation turns out to be an investigation into the origins of the journal, spurred on by the discovery that there may be an underground bunker near the location where Dipper first found it. Wendy immediately proves herself useful by locating the entrance and finding a path inside, but when Mabel finds a confession letter in Dipper's pocket, she pushes her brother into confessing his feelings, accidentally sending them into another room in the process. There, they're cornered by a monster and rescued by a mysterious individual who appears to be the author of the journals. Dipper is excited to get to know him as he recruits their help for tracking down a shape-shifting monster that got loose inside the caves. But Wendy is able to deduce that the man himself is the shapeshifter, and they attempt to flee him, meeting back up with Seuss and Mabel to catch up on the situation. They set a trap for the monster, but Wendy is separated from the group with it. Thinking that she's been injured, Dipper laments over her unconscious body that he didn't confess earlier, only for the real Wendy to overhear it. When the monster comes to, they scuffle and the two are mixed up. Dipper and Wendy are able to communicate a secret sign between each other, and the monster is soon injured enough to be placed back into cryostasis. But not before giving Dipper a chilling warning about his fate should he continue to search for the author. Ultimately, Wendy and Dipper stop to sort out their feelings on his confession and, while she ultimately turns him down for being too young, admits that he's at least a good enough person that she still enjoys spending time together with him. This episode not only pushes the plot forward directly, but does so as an intentional decision by the characters within the narrative. It's extremely uncommon for a show of any type to have an episode where the characters just decide to progress the plot out of anything other than necessity, with that progression not coming across as contrived. But the strength of Gravity Falls' character writing makes it so that sort of thing can occur in a completely natural way. But what also helps this episode not come across as plot for the sake of plot is the fact that a major relationship is effectively shot down in this episode. Wendy and Dipper's relationship is put solidly into friend territory by this episode's conclusion, but rather than this being a purely depressing story about Dipper losing out on love, the episode is instead spent showing off how well the duo can cooperate as friends, as if not to give a last hurrah to their time together, but instead to prove that they don't need romance for a happy relationship going into the future. The Gulf War Tired of a feud with Pacifica, Mabel decides to cheer her up with a round of mini-golf, only for Pacifica to show up there as well, and the two to continue their argument anew. They challenge each other to a mini-golf tournament for bragging rights at midnight that night, and Mabel breaks into the ground with Dipper in order to get some early practice in. While there, they discover that the course is secretly controlled by a race of ball people named the Lilliputians, who are all feuding over which course is the best. 
so Mabel decides to manipulate the Lilliputchins by declaring that whoever assists her mini golf game the best will receive a sticker that declares them number one. Pacifica arrives and the plan goes as normal, until the other holes start to realize that Mabel doesn't seem to be favoring any one of them, and that they can one-up the rest by simply slaying Pacifica outright rather than sabotaging her golf game. Mabel declares that anybody who would kill for their cause doesn't deserve the sticker, and she destroys it, causing them to turn on her and Pacifica both. So the girls have to team up in order to fight their way out, and upon succeeding, decide that perhaps their feud was somewhat pointless in the first place. Using the paranormal for personal vendettas has rarely gone right for any of the antagonistic forces in Gravity Falls, and this still holds true even when it's our protagonist using them for ill purposes. Despite this sort of thing being shown again and again, Mabel still fails to learn from these lessons and falls into the same mode of thinking that they've seen cause the downfall of characters like Gideon before. Although manipulating the Lilliputians despite not knowing their true temperament is less of an issue of Mabel not picking up on the mistakes of others, and more so a result of her becoming enraged enough that she too would fall into such a habit. Her feud with Pacifica makes her angry, and the anger clouds her judgement to the point that she has this moral failing that results in the duo nearly being killed. And so it makes sense that she attempts to rescue Pacifica in the end. Upon realizing that her hubris has caused an incident beyond what she's prepared to handle, Mabel gets to experience firsthand what so many of the antagonists of Gravity Falls have already seen. And so she herself gets to realize that she's becoming the bad guy. Because while Pacifica may be annoying, that's a terribly small crime compared to sicking a group of tiny warhawks on your opposition. And so Maple can earn her trip on the high road by the end of the episode because she's seen the other side. Sock Opera Dipper and Mabel are trying to figure out the password to a laptop they found inside the journal author's secret bunker, but Mabel is distracted by a guy with puppets and leaves Dipper to find out the password on his own. She puts on a puppet show to impress the guy, leaving very little time to assist Dipper, who begins to face a countdown to all the data on the laptop destroying itself as a failsafe. Then, Bill Cipher appears and gives the boy an offer. He'll open up the laptop if Dipper agrees to give him a puppet. Dipper agrees, thinking that Bill will only take one of Mabel's sock puppets, but he instead decides that he wants Dipper to be his puppet instead. While inhabiting Dipper's body, Bill destroys the laptop and proceeds to head out to destroy the journal, which is currently being used as a prop in Mabel's puppet show. But the disembodied Dipper manages to take control of one of Mabel's puppets and warns her of the plot, so after some hesitation, she agrees to have her play ruined in exchange for keeping the book out of Bill's hands. In the end, she manages to expel Bill from the body by exploiting her knowledge of her brother, and the day is saved, at the expense of Mabel's chances with the puppet guy. Here, Bill is more properly introduced as a villain for the second season of the show. His first appearance was more of a one-off to tease his later involvement, but by now, he's become one of the primary antagonists to the Mystery Twins. Without the restraint of Gideon, we finally get to see a more in-depth look at what his methods are for influencing others, not only his control over minds and the mindscape, but how he uses their emotions to pry them apart before he negotiates details of his deals with them. Dipper wouldn't normally do something that could put his sister in jeopardy, unless Bill is able to first convince him that she'd do the same to him. And in the end, Mabel is willing to let go of something important to her to stop Bill's plans to destroy the journal. Through episodes like this, we're able to ultimately see how Bill's endgame will play out. Drive the twins apart, so he can manipulate them individually. As long as the family sticks together, he's more or less powerless against them, but the lone target is much easier to get a foothold in the physical world where he can start to cause mayhem. So long as the close relationships of the cast are maintained, he won't be able to do much but watch. Seuss and the Real Girl Seuss's cousin, Reggie, is throwing an engagement party, and his abuelita wants him to find a date for it. But since Seuss has never been in a relationship before, he turns to Dipper and Mabel for help talking to women. Even with their assistance, the attempts go poorly until he takes refuge in a game store and finds Romance Academy 7. Despite the cashier's warnings, he buys the game and uses it to practice talking to Giffany, the main heroine of the title, throughout the night, to the point that he misses work the next day. 
Concerned, the mystery twins coerce him out of the house to talk to real woman, and while out there, he manages to befriend Melody, and the two organize a first date. But Giffany is enraged that the guy she's been talking to is now talking to real woman, and she escapes the confines of the game to follow him around, threatening Zeus while he's on his date. She takes control of an animatronic chipmunk and uses the nearby electronics to terrorize the group before Zeus finally takes matters into his own hands and throws the Romance Academy 7 CD into a fire, destroying the stalker. In the B-plot, Stan throws out Old Goldie, a primitive mechanical dispenser from the Mystery Shack, and discovers the wonders of life-sized animatronics and their ability to get kids to give up their money. Trying to prove that he's not too old for the animatronic game, he sets out to steal a robot badger, only for that badger to start fighting him when Giffany takes over all the machines in the building. He's saved by Old Goldie, and the two take a celebratory trip to Vegas. Representative of the show as a whole, this episode is inundated with pop culture references, some even managing to predate several cultural icons with similar themes. The episode title itself is a reference to Lars and the Real Girl, a movie about Ryan Gosling dating a doll in a wheelchair, with similar themes of social isolation leading to personality disorders. It also has a crowd of animatronics trying to attack a group of children, airing only a month after the release of Five Nights at Freddy's and being in production several months before that. And also, it shares similar themes and framing to Doki Doki Literature Club, a game about a dating sim character that becomes sentient. Although that game was released three years after this episode, and both of them borrow extremely heavily from Kimi Tokano Joke, Tokano Jo no Koi, also involving a Yandere character archetype falling in love not with the player character, but the player themselves. This is the first real Seuss episode of the series, a strange thing it took this long considering how pivotal of a role he's played in the series thus far behind the scenes. He regularly shows up to help Dipper and Mabel whenever they need an adult around for something like a car chase or if something needs to be fixed, like the laptop from the bunker. It's a bit of a shame that he sort of gets overshadowed in this own episode by the impeccable sprite work of Paul Robertson, which is what this episode is remembered for. Probably a good thing considering Stan marries a decaying statue in Vegas. Little Gift Shop of Horrors a second anthology episode told from a first-person perspective of somebody stepping into the mystery shack at night for shelter, only for Stan to tell them a series of tall tales in order to convince them to buy something. The first tale is Hands Off. The Pines family attends a local swap meet where Stan manages to palm a watch from a woman who's clearly a witch. But the next morning his hands are cursed to disappear. He tries to hide this fact from Dipper and Mabel for a while, but eventually relents and the trio head into the Hand Witch's cave to get them back. While there, it's revealed that she only steals hands because she's lonely, so Mabel gives her cave a makeover, and they all have a happy ending, with Stan getting his hands back and the witch managing to attract a lost himbo. The next tale is A Baconings. Dipper creates an intelligence serum so he can solve a puzzle, but Waddles eats it all and becomes super intelligent as a result, using a robotic aid to move about and communicate. Dipper and Waddles start to create all sorts of gadgets while leaving Mabel out of more and more of their activities, until eventually, Waddles creates a massive machine that will surely lead to an international fame and recognition. But Mabel fears that he'll never have the time to be with her again, and Waddles realizes that there's no point in making the world a better place if he can't make the world tolerable for his favorite person. So he undoes his own intelligence and goes back to being a stupid pig. The third tale is Clay Day. Mabel gets scared of an old claymation movie due to a phobia of hers, and so Dipper and Stan take her to the house of Harry Claymore, an old-school claymation legend, to show her that it's all special effects in an attempt to get her over her fears. But once there, they're kidnapped by sentient clay creatures, and Claymore tells them how he used magic to make the figures animate themselves. In the end, Mabel realizes that she can simply reshape the clay into something more appealing, and uses this knowledge to free her friends and family. In the end, her phobia goes away, as phobias are irrational fears, and her fear is now very much rational. After all of these stories, Stan gets annoyed with the customer as he's not buying anything, so he drugs the POV character and turns him into a Mystery Shack exhibit labeled The Cheapskate. Society of the Blind Eye 
Mabel is lamenting over her failed summer romances while Dipper is stressed over not knowing the identity of the author when Mabel finds a clue on the smashed laptop that hints at the fact that it was created by Old Man McGucket. So they interrogate the man in his junkyard home, finding out that he doesn't remember anything related to the journals, and this directs them to the location of his first memory, the museum. While there, they observe a few shadowy figures in the distance and follow them to a secret underground room where they observe a ceremony. The hooded figures use a machine to erase the memories of the supernatural from the townsfolk before releasing them back into Gravity Falls. The group follows the extracted memory to a hall full of them, hoping to locate McGucket's memories of the creation of the journals. They're eventually caught by the cultists, who identify themselves as the Society of the Blind Eye, founded to erase unwanted memories of the townsfolk so they can continue living regular lives despite the paranormal activity surrounding them. McGucket's memories are retrieved after a chase and the cultists have their situation flipped around, with Mabel and Dipper deciding to erase their memories of the society completely, effectively dismantling the group. Once they're all alone, they observe McGucket's memories in order to find out what he knows and learn that he invented the device that wipes memories, as well as founding the society so he could forget his involvement with some mysterious machine that the real author was working on. A constant source of comic relief throughout the series has been from the antics of the various side characters of Gravity Falls. The silly ways they lead their lives fit in well with the esoteric monstrosities that live in the woods surrounding them. It's part of the setting that seems to fit well. Nobody notices anything weird in the town's outskirts because everything inside the town itself is already weird. But then this episode recontextualizes everything. For the behavior of the townsfolk not to be considered some inherent wackiness, but rather, the result of years of memory altering takes away much of the earlier comedic tone to why the town of Gravity Falls is the way it is. This episode then marks a turning point in the show's overall tone. It's no longer as funny that life goes on with all the strangeness surrounding the town. There's a subtle darkness to every shenanigan that goes on in the background, and the potential collateral damage, insofar as traumatizing a bystander, is much higher. There's a reason that Stan didn't want Dipper and Mabel to be exposed to the paranormal world throughout the last season. And this episode also presents one of the antagonistic forces that have existed through the show's run up to this point, dismantling it just as their deal is explained. A force being mobilized to ensure nobody learns anything they shouldn't only makes those things much more sinister from the framing against that backdrop, that somebody is protecting the town from this knowledge for a reason. Blendon's Game Blendon Blandon, from the Time Traveler's Pig, has escaped Time Prison and invoked Globnar, a multi-dimensional set of challenges that serves as a sort of trial by combat. He's fighting for his innocence against Dipper and Mabel, with the winner deciding the fate of the loser and also receiving a Time Wish, capable of anything. But Dipper and Mabel are busy trying to figure out why Seuss doesn't want to celebrate his own birthday when they're taken through time to his challenge and they escape in order to get back to their friend. They overshoot their destination and wind up at the Mystery Shack 10 years ago, where they meet a young Seuss and try to deduce why he doesn't like celebrating his birthday. As it turns out, his father never came to his parties and his birthday was the day he learned he'd never come back. Unable to fix this problem, Dipper and Mabel resolve to enter the Globnar, hoping to use their time wish to allow Seuss to see his father again. After a victory, they decide to not only give Blinden his old job back and a full head of hair, but they also give the time wish to Seuss so he can choose to see his father again on his own. But Seuss doesn't wish for that, as he's learned that if his father doesn't care about him, then it's better to focus on spending time with the people who do. An alternate version of this episode was pitched at one point where the time wish would have instead been a time orb that can see into the future. It would have shown Seuss being a good father to his own children in spite of his own upbringing, but was later changed to the ending that we got. The overall message stays the same, however, that the value in family doesn't come from the fact that they are family, but in how they act towards you instead. Seuss's father was a deadbeat despite being related to him, yet Dipper and Mabel are like siblings to him despite not having the blood relation. Considering the strong theme in Gravity Falls about family ties, it makes sense there would also be a found family message thrown in there. One thing that has changed between the first and second seasons of Gravity Falls is the amount of attention that side characters have received. 
I've already mentioned before that Dipper and Mabel have a close relation since the beginning of the show, and that strong togetherness is something that persists throughout the entire series. So the extra attention given to the side cast isn't just a result of the ensemble being more deserving of that spotlight, but the fact that there are only so many plots that can wind up the same way before it gets boring. An exploration of the side cast in Gravity Falls also allows for plots to follow different directions that the Mystery Twins possibly couldn't follow themselves. The Love God Wendy's friend group has finally accepted Dipper and Mabel as regular members, largely as a replacement for Robbie who still hasn't gotten over his crush on Wendy. They make plans to go to Woodstick, a music festival near Gravity Falls, but Mabel is hesitant to enjoy herself while Robbie is acting so miserable. So she plans on playing matchmaker, hooking Robbie up with Tambury, the girl who never does anything but text. These plans don't work out immediately though, and soon Mabel turns to a celebrity rock musician who's playing at the concert named The Love God, who turns out to be an actual love god. She steals a love potion from him and uses it to make the goth couple fall for each other, but this has disastrous consequences when the rest of the group starts getting at each other's throat over the development. So Maple has to sneak another potion away from the love god in order to undo her mistake, only to later learn that perhaps it's better if they stay in love, as messing with other people's heads has only brought misery so far. In the end, the friend group gets back together on their own anyway over their mutual enjoyment of Thompson's misery. In the B-plot, Stan tries to appeal to kids with a giant balloon of his head with the words I heart kids on the front, Though when it sets sail, it catches fire and spells out I eat kids instead, which leads Stan to deduce that it's better to be feared by children anyway. Despite her long history of heartbreak and failed relationships, Mabel still views herself as an expert on the subject of love and matchmaking, drawn in direct contrast to Dipper, who has had one failure and called the whole thing off by this point. This ultimately comes down to a difference in philosophy between the two, that Mabel views the attempts as more successful than the outcome, while Dipper cares more about the end result than what it took to get there. Reflected in this episode is Mabel's enthusiasm for matchmaking, leading to an incident where the friend group is broken up as a result of not having planned out her foray as well as she could have. She cares more that a couple was formed than the implication of those two going out could have been. But this is far from being shown as inherently disastrous. Because while the new status quo at the end of this episode has the effects of the love potion persisting, the old norm is still something that comes back as far as group dynamics go, purely because the status quo has a way of reinforcing itself as long as that initial dynamic was something that should have existed in the first place. If a friend group can permanently break up because of one obstacle, then maybe that group shouldn't have been close together in the first place. But if that same group really does have the proper chemistry, then a single outside incident won't cause any irreparable harm. Northwest Mansion Mystery The Northwest family is throwing a massive party exclusively for the upper crust of society when a series of paranormal events begin to occur. They call in Dipper to exorcise the ghost, as he seems to be an expert in this sort of thing, but he refuses at first due to his hatred of the Northwest family. It isn't until they agree to allow Mabel, Grinda, and Candy into the party in exchange for his work that he agrees. When he arrives, it turns out that the ghost is the vengeful spirit of a lumberjack, who helped to build the mansion, only to be turned away from its gates despite their promise to allow the common folk into the ballroom. After capturing the ghost, Dipper learns of this promise and he's soon tricked into freeing the spirit, who then wreaks havoc on the partygoers, including Mabel. In the end, it comes down to Pacifica to liberate all of the captured guests by allowing everybody into the mansion against her father's wishes, proving once and for all that she doesn't have to be like her family, and the curse is finally lifted. In the B-plot, Mabel and Candy conspire to leave Grinda out of their plan to flirt with an Austrian prince, only for Grinda's aggressive flirting style to wind up being the thing that wins him over. I almost feel as though this episode didn't need a B-plot. The whole thing feels a bit tacked on purely to give breathing room to the more involved and character-driven A-plot. The only real thing the B-plot does is give Dipper some reason to go back into the party after learning that Pacifica lied to him, as he's interested in saving his sister. But if the B-plot was cut out, there would have been more room for Dipper and Pacifica to get to know one another, and then it would have tracked well enough for his character to have changed his mind on whether she's worth saving. In the end, the episode still manages to work, 
Although the finale of Old Man McGucket regaining his memories and failing to warn Dipper of the impending danger gives this episode a quasi-C plot that ends up doing very little but feeling like a tacked-on to be continued. Pacifica, like so many other side characters, started out as a one-note stereotype of an archetype, the kind of character whose introduction can tell you exactly who they are so viewers can use existing cultural knowledge to have her role informed without needing quite so many establishing scenes. But in the last few episodes, we've seen more background given to McGucket, Seuss, and Robbie, so it makes sense that we get an episode that humanizes Pacifica now as well. It all builds up to the finale in a way that makes each character's involvement in that plot feel much less contrived and gives the level of significance that the finale does have a deserved sort of build-up. Not what he seems. The Pines family are enjoying themselves when the government agents from the beginning of the season finally make their move, acting on security footage of Stan stealing large amounts of nuclear waste, among his other shady behaviors. They arrest Stan and prepare to take Dipper and Mabel into Child Protective Services, but they escape as they don't believe any of the charges against their grunkle. As they run back home, they're warned that their uncle is not what he seems, and that he's been lying to the world as well as the kids his whole life. But they refuse to believe these claims and collect the security footage of the incident, which confirms the agent's story. While searching for more proof, the two come across evidence that Stan has been leading a double life, with multiple fake IDs and newspaper clippings of his own death and tales of a similar looking con man on the loose. When they finally discover his hidden cave beneath the shack, all the pieces come together, that there's some kind of doomsday device beneath the ground that's close to activation, and the journals warn that it may have disastrous consequences if activated. Stan enters and implores them not to use the emergency shutoff switch, but Dipper no longer trusts the man. In the end, it comes down to Mabel, whether to believe the evidence she's seen or to follow along with Dipper, and she ultimately chooses to believe her uncle. The machine activates, and a six-fingered figure steps out of a portal, the author of the journals. The twist of Stan's secret research is something that's been built towards since the very first episode of the show, as early even as the opening credits, at least to viewers savvy enough to shift a brief flash of letters back three characters to read a hidden message. Much of the in-text foreshadowing to Stan's true nature has been vague and unhelpful in determining what it was that he's actually planned to do. It's not until you deeply engage with the work, digging through the show frame by frame to find as many esoteric ciphers and coded messages that you can truly figure out, very little more than that. But it's not as though this is inherently a bad thing. Any fan fervent enough to go on the hunt for these ciphers is clearly somebody obsessed with the thrill of engagement more than the end result, and giving them fuel to spoil future twists might only drive off casual viewers. It's a bit like re-watching a show despite knowing how it ends. The journey certainly has more value than the surprise of the destination. But another thing that's been built up since the beginning of the series is the thematic core of this episode. The relationships that family members have to one another has informed the resolution to so many plots that the only way to have heightened stakes by this point is to put pre-established ideologies against one another. If forced to choose between the happiness of her brother or anything else, Mabel will choose her twin. We've seen this time and time again. But what happens if Mabel has to choose between two family members? In the end, she chooses the side of trusting someone, even if there's sufficient evidence that he's not really related to her. But what does that matter whether or not he's blood relation when he's clearly served the role of great uncle by now? A Tale of Two Stands the episode is primarily told through a series of flashbacks to Stanley and Stan Ford's childhoods, told as the government agents are searching for the hidden portal room. The grunkle Stan we've come to know being Stanley, and his six-fingered twin brother as Stanford. The two grew up with very little but each other, not that they would mind. Ford was the more brainy twin while Stanley was the bronze of the two, and they would set out on a series of adventures during their youth. But it was clear that Stanford was more likely to accomplish things with his life, and his newest science experiment was a clear indicator of his genius. When a jealous Stanley accidentally breaks it, though, the family views this as an act of jealousy and kicks him out, where he's forced to adopt various conman identities to adapt and make a living while Stanford focuses on his science, eventually winding up with the love of the paranormal, spurred on by his superfluous finger. 
Stanford sets up a shack in the woods of Gravity Falls, hoping to investigate the mysteries surrounding the town and writing three journals to track his findings, journals which ultimately contain the secrets to construct a portal to open a dimensional rift between worlds so that he can better study these phenomena. But when McGucket, not yet an old man, is briefly sucked into the portal, he's shaken enough to declare the project should be shut down, and Stanford agrees. But, not wanting his life's work destroyed, he instead calls upon his brother Stanley to hide the journal, instead of outright destroying it. In their argument, the device is activated and Stanford gets sucked in just before it destroys itself. Unable to rebuild it and running out of money, he eventually resigns to opening up the mystery shack to tourists in order to stay near the site of the incident while also adopting the identity of his brother to avoid his questionable past catching up to him. In the end, the story catches up to the modern day, where government agents are preparing to storm the secret room, but Ford is able to amplify the memory eraser from Society of the Blind Eye to con the agents out of a continued pursuit. The relationship between Dipper and Mabel is reflected heavily in the relationship between Stan Lee and Stan Ford, with the key difference being their time together versus their time apart. Dipper and Stanford both appear to be the more cerebral of their duos, but it's that airheadedness that often leads to trouble that Stan Lee or Mabel end up having to drag them out of, and that unending support plays into a feedback loop that keeps both of them happy as long as they have each other. While apart, Stanford grows strange and paranoid, while Stan Lee continues in a downward spiral of desperation and crime. So the end result is that Stan Ford and Stan Lee have a strained relationship due to their disagreements, but a relationship that was once close and pure-hearted, a relationship not unlike Dipper and Mabel's. And this is why Grunkle Stan refuses to let Ford's paranormal research get near the kids. It isn't just him trying to protect people he loves from danger, but that he's trying to protect a relationship that reflects what he no longer has. Dungeons, Dungeons, and More Dungeons Dipper gets a new board game titled Dungeons, Dungeons, and More Dungeons, but due to the amount of math involved, can't find anybody willing to play it with him. That is, until he stumbles into Ford's lab, despite being warned by Stan to avoid involving himself with whatever goes on in there. But when Ford sees the iconic die from the game, he proclaims his love of the title, and the two begin playing the TTRPG together. This soon spreads to the living room, much to the annoyance of the rest of the family, and when they scuffle over who gets the floor space, an accidental roll of an infinity-sided die is performed, which brings the villains from the game to life. Dipper and Ford are kidnapped, and Mabel, Grinda, and Stanley have to team up in order to fight their way to the rescue. This culminates in the trio facing Probilitor the Annoying, in a real-life version of the game, for the rescue of the kidnapped nerds. Mabel's imagination, combined with Stanley's con artist skills, enable a victory and everyone is reunited. In the end, Stanley decides that perhaps he's been too harsh with Dipper, and that if they want to have a more friendly relationship with his twin brother, there's no harm in doing so. Despite the close relationship between Dipper and Mabel, there are still quite a few differences between the twins, differences that lead to a majority of their conflicts. These arguments are never enough for the duo to break things off indefinitely, but as they still exist, there's still the potential for a more perfect duo of the two to form. While Dipper may not share all of his interests with Mabel, he does have significantly more in common with Ford, and so this leads to a proper challenge to the twins' relationship. What kind of kinship remains when you find another person you get along with even better? Is it probable for Dipper to abandon his closest companion in favor of a person who understands him more? The finale of the show ultimately asks these questions on a grander scale, and an episode like this one helps to set up how that conflict might get put into the heads of the characters, as well as the audience. Another thing this episode does is more thoroughly explore the dynamics between the two sets of twins, insofar as Dipper and Stanford's curiosity being tempered by Mabel and Stanley respectively. While the latter pair in return often helps to facilitate the dreams of the other, were Dipper and Ford to remain alone, they would certainly end up releasing some kind of weirdness onto the world, but they have their twin to keep their flights of fancy to a more realistic minimum. Stanley warns Dipper about spending time with his brother, as he's aware of the potential damage his imagination can cause. He spent the last 30 years dealing with the fallout of one of his experiments. And so the ending to this episode, while heartwarming, is a concerning portent of what's to come. The Stanchurian Candidate 
The elderly mayor of Gravity Falls dies, leaving the position of mayor open for the taking. Stan, tired of being disrespected by his family in favor of Ford, decides to run for the position to get a bit of respect as well as to leave a legacy. He runs against Bud Gleeful, among a few others, and is quickly demolished in the polls. So Dipper turns to Ford for advice, and the researcher gives him a mind control tie that allows Dipper and Mabel to control his actions and make him more personable. This plan works, and Bud is pressed into a corner, where it's revealed that his plan to run for mayor was just a ploy by Gideon to get pardoned out of prison. Gideon turns to the supernatural to take control of his father, and uses his charisma to pull ahead in the election, just as Stanley finds out about the mind control and rejects the mystery twins' assistance. Bud Gideon begin to win in the polls, with Dipper and Mabel being attacked and tied to a bunch of fireworks set to go off at the end of the final debate. But Stan, finding out his family is in danger, gives up on campaigning to go rescue them, and this wins over the support of the townsfolk. After saving their lives, he's given the overwhelming majority of the vote, only two in the end have it revealed that he's committed so many crimes he's ineligible. And so the position of mayor passes to the only candidate who filled out the right paperwork, the get em guy. Stan's insecurities come up in this episode, and somewhat understandably so. While he was once the fun-loving, irresponsible uncle to the Mystery Twins, okaying whatever hijinks they got up to, he's now no longer the chill adult in their lives, that role being replaced with Ford, as the latter is able to facilitate dives into the esoteric mysteries of the town of Gravity Falls. Now the stern, responsible one, he starts to lose the respect of Dipper and Mabel, as they have a new, cooler uncle to spend their time with. And with him only being allowed to temporarily squat in Stanford's house until the end of the summer, he's a guy who's about to lose everything he had. So a run for mayor is perhaps the only refuge from his impending ousting from the society he's come to love to scam over the last few decades. The childhood trauma of being the bad twin is now coming back. This episode also serves as the breaking point for Gideon, a character who was previously assumed written out of the show. His status as an Act 1 only antagonist still holds pretty fast though, with limited options to influence the outside world due to his imprisonment, he's placed into a position of desperation and is much more willing to become a puppet for a more menacing character like Bill Cipher. His replacement by another, darker villain is put into comparison with the overall darker aspects of the latter half of the show, even lampshaded during his reveal to the twins as he points out how evil they've become, resorting to mind control tactics to get their way. The Last Mabel Corn in order to safeguard the Mystery Shack from Bill's influence, Ford needs unicorn hair to erect a barrier. But the unicorns are, in his words, frustrating. Despite this, Mabel volunteers to retrieve the hair, as she believes that she's pure enough of heart to parlay with them. She recruits the help of Wendy, Grenda, and Candy to find and speak with them, and they soon come across Celestabella Bethabel, the last unicorn. But Mabel's heart is not deemed as pure enough, and so she sets out to perform enough good deeds to earn that honor. But when even this isn't enough, the other girls go behind her back to take the hair by force. In the end, it's revealed that unicorns can't actually read people's hearts, and that Celeste Bella Bethabel simply made that up to keep humans out and keep the hair for itself. So the girls simply resort to violence, tired of the high expectations on them. Meanwhile, Ford is planning to keep the denizens of the Mystery Shack safe through other means, encrypting their thoughts so Bill can't read them. But while Dipper is undergoing the mind-scanning process, he gets the idea to use the scanner on a passed-out Ford, if only so he can learn a few of its secrets. But when the scan reveals that Ford has made a deal with Bill in the past, Dipper turns on him and prepares to erase his memories. Only for Ford to admit that, while he did make a deal with Bill before, he regrets it and his work is now to seal away the potential for Bill to enter their world. This episode plays with the story surrounding society's expectations of girls and people in general by using the high barrier of entry the unicorns have placed arbitrarily as an obstacle to self-esteem. Mabel is constantly told during this episode that she isn't good or pure enough to be allowed to approach the unicorn, which ends up causing her distress, as she searches for some other way to satisfy the unicorn's seemingly impossible standards. It's not until the other girls of the group finally decide not to play by the rules that they're able to get what they want, and Mabel can get the self-esteem boost she wants through the praise of her grumble Ford. 
If you attach your self-worth to other people's opinions of you, especially the opinions of people who are gatekeeping subjective things from you, then you'll never be satisfied as these are people who will never be content with the kind of person you are. It's only by rejecting the standards of other people and taking the emotional satisfaction that you want for yourself that you can finally find inner peace, as inner peace is obviously something that you have to produce internally. Likewise, Dipper also seeks some sort of validation from Ford, who has been his idol since he discovered the journals, and wants to get closer to the guy to show that he's worthy of that praise. He reads his great uncle's mind in an attempt to figure out more of the mysteries, that he might become more involved in the fight against Bill Cipher, only to prove that he wasn't truly ready for that information as he takes it badly. And yet, in the end, Ford laments that it's possibly his own fault for not opening up to Dipper as much as he could have showing the difference between himself as a positive role model and Celeste Bella Bethabel as a negative one. Roadside Attraction Stan is going on an RV trip around Oregon to destroy all of his competition's tourist traps and he invites the kids along so Dipper can get over his obsession with Wendy. While there, he attempts to flirt with various girls as a method of distraction, but Dipper's attempts fail, so he turns to Stan for aid and gets a few tips on confidence that wind up with him getting a series of phone numbers. Yet this newfound confidence also attracts the attention of Mabel's friend Candy, who announces her crush to the others. In the end, Dipper winds up reuniting with all the different girls he'd been flirting with, and the secret of his womanizing is out, something which causes Candy to lose interest. Meanwhile, Stan starts flirting with the owner of Mystery Mountain, who turns out to be a shape-shifting spider intent on turning him into the newest attraction. The kids team up to save him, giving Candy a moment to have the spotlight while also dissolving her crush on Dipper when she sees him running away from the giant spiders like a little girl. Gravity Falls as a show is a metaphor for growing up, and this episode sends Dipper through an exploration of the idea that one has to be a womanizer in order to be a man. He takes the advice of one of his role models, Stan, and starts mimicking the guy's behavior. This gives him the confidence boost he was looking for, but also has the expected realistic outcome that Dipper should have seen coming. Stan is an unspecified number of years old, but still elderly. There's no mention of him having a successful relationship in the past, and he's currently single. So for Dipper to take advice from him should have come with the obvious warning of what was to come. In the end, he grows much closer to his grunkle by experiencing the same heartbreak that he has. This kind of flirting and leading people on will end up hurting them, so don't act shocked if they aren't happy to see you again. But truthfully, this episode is just one last lighthearted comedy before the show begins to wrap itself up. From this point on, the comedy elements of the show wind down and a more serious tone is taken, as each plot and character thread wraps itself up. Coinciding with this is the ending of Dipper and Mabel's childhood as they prepare for their 13th birthday and the end of summer, but that's for the next episode. Dipper and Mabel versus the Future Dipper and Mabel are preparing for their 13th birthday party, which is only a week away, and Mabel has planned a final party to celebrate not only their ending childhood, but their ending summer in Gravity Falls. But when Dipper is called away to search for an extraterrestrial adhesive to patch up the dimensional rift, Mabel is left to plan the party on her own. And she not only finds out that none of her friends are going to be around for the end of summer, but that high school isn't all it's cracked up to be but she takes some comfort in the fact that she'll at the very least have Dipper to help her through it all. Yet Dipper's journey into a crashed UFO in the center of town proves successful enough that Ford offers him a position as his apprentice, even though that will separate him from his twin sister. When Mabel overhears the exchange where Dipper declares his intentions to leave her, she goes into the woods accidentally taking Dipper's bag with her. There, she meets Blendon Blandon, who offers her the ability to stay in Gravity Falls forever with an eternal summer, in exchange for the dimensional rift. She hands it over, and Blendon is revealed to be a vessel for Bill Cipher, who smashes the rift and brings about the apocalypse of Weird Mageddon. Mabel and Stanley are both the charismatic twins of their respective pairs, with a charisma that doesn't translate directly into worldly success. Both are left behind by the opportunities afforded to their sibling, who doubles as their closest friend, and grow resentful that they're not good enough to stay in a peaceful period of their life with the person closest to them. 
but the love they have of their respective twin is not enough to actively attempt sabotage. Stanley demolishing Ford's perpetual motion machine was something done accidentally, but not something he's willing to immediately ask about as he anticipates a positive outcome for himself. Mabel hands over the dimensional rift despite knowing it doesn't belong to her, again, something she expects will be good for her despite the potential harm it might cause for her family. Bill Cipher has spent enough time in Ford's mind in the past to know to expect this outcome. Although he isn't able to directly contact or possess the Pines family, he is able to hit them where they're the weakest, in their emotions. Bill is able to exploit the pain of losing somebody close in order to manipulate Mabel into making a selfish mistake, as he knows that Stanley would have at some point been vulnerable enough to make the same error. And so we get to see how that dependence that the Pines family has on each other is able to be exploited as a weakness. Weird Mageddon Part 1 Weird Mageddon has begun, and Bill Cipher begins terrorizing the town of Gravity Falls, unleashing uncomprehensible horrors on its former inhabitants. Dipper and Ford plan on taking out the Triumphant Triangle, but the weirdness of the event throws off Ford's shot, and he's captured, turned into a golden statue, and kept as a backscratcher by Bill, who follows this up by destroying all of the journals. Dipper, now on his own, seeks out the rest of his family, but ends up reuniting with Wendy instead. The two make a plan to rescue Mabel from the clutches of an imprisoning sphere guarded by Gideon, who is finally happy to control the woman he loves. Despite their best efforts, they're eventually chased down and surrounded, only for Dipper to talk person to person to Gideon, where he convinces the guy not to hold Mabel prisoner, as she wouldn't want that, and that he should strive to be a better person instead of taking what he wants by force. So Gideon relents, allowing Dipper to enter the weirdness sphere encircling his sister, while he takes his force of former convicts to fight Bill directly. The first part of a three-part finale to the show, Weird Mageddon serves as the culmination of everything that's been built up to from the beginning. Near the beginning of the plot, Bill takes and destroys the journals, while also capturing their author before forgetting about Dipper, assuming he'll be killed off with ease. It mirrors the season 1 finale, when Gideon similarly assumes that Dipper will be worthless without the journal, and leaves him be. And like the season 1 finale, this episode has Dipper take a final exam of sorts, where he uses the things he's learned to prove that he's worth something without the guides. But where season 1 had him show off a newfound confidence and courage, season 2 instead focuses on the relationship he's built over the summer. It's not alone that he charges in to save Mabel, it's alongside Wendy and Seuss, and in the end, it's not defeating Gideon that gives him the last obstacle overcome before his sister, but befriending him, teaching him an honest lesson about self-improvement that comes from his own personal experience. The primary purpose of this episode is largely to show the damage to the town of Gravity Falls, how much it has fallen, and how certain landmarks have become unrecognizable. The third part to the finale is about the people of Gravity Falls, the second part is about Dipper and Mabel's relationship, and this part, the town itself, as in the geography and the paranormal things surrounding it. These things exist as a character in their own right, and it's fitting that they would get the same amount of spotlight as a major relationship. Weird Mageddon 2 Escape from Reality Wendy, Seuss, and Dipper enter Mabel Land, the land where everything is controlled by Mabel and nobody's problems ever matter. Wendy and Seuss are both tempted by the things that they've always wanted out of life and abandon their quest to rescue Mabel, but Dipper stays headstrong and tries to convince her that she needs to leave the bubble and go back into the real world to save Gravity Falls. But this ends up drawing the ire of Mabel Land's inhabitants, who force Dipper to defend reality in a trial. During this trial, several of Mabel and Dipper's worst memories are put on display, showing off the negative aspects of the real world. But Dipper ultimately convinces Mabel that these terrible moments were all made better by the two of them sticking together. He finishes off his argument by declaring that he no longer has any intention of spending the rest of the year with Ford's research, as he would prefer to spend it with his twin sister instead. Mabel Ann turns against the group, revealing itself as a trap set by Bill all along, and they barely manage to escape before returning to the Mystery Shack, where they find Grunkle Stan and a few of the townsfolk hiding in secret. Meanwhile, Bill attempts to take his domination worldwide, but is stopped by a force field, containing his minions to Gravity Falls. Unsure how to break out, he decides to unfreeze Horde for interrogation. 
Dipper and Mabel's relationship has been the backbone of the series from the inception through to the very end. Despite everything that happens to them individually, they always come out together at the end of it all and solve the issue as a duo. It's fitting that Weird Mageddon only came about as the result of an argument between the two, just as much as it's fitting that the finale would begin to wrap up purely because the two are reunited. What's also sensible is that Ford's initial plan to take out Bill in the previous episode would fail, as it's one that, while not contradictory to the universe, is contradictory to the story that's been set up thus far. His plan was to take out Bill first, then save his family after the fact, but anyone who's been paying attention will know that plots have never worked that way. It's understandable why Ford, of all people, would make that mistake, considering his fractured relationship with his brother, and Dipper only goes along with it at first due to a misguided reverence for the guy. But it's Mabel's dreams that are a hindrance to the plot's progression at this point. She needs to be rescued from her own nature of wanting things to remain the same. Thus far, Mabel has been greatly concerned with the unfamiliar, but is always ready to face it anyway as she knows Dipper has got her back. But to not only move on from childhood, but to do so alone, is a step too far outside her comfort zone, and so she retreats back inside of it as far as she can go, even creating an alternate version of her brother out of what she wants him to be. But the real Dipper wins out in the end, not the version of him she wants, but the version of him she needs to help guide her through the uncomfortable. Weird Mageddon 3 Take Back the Falls Dipper and Mabel join the cowering masses inside the Mystery Shack, which has become a shelter due to the unicorn hair barrier that Mabel and Ford erected a few episodes back, and they work together to motivate everybody to rescue Ford, as he's the only one with the knowledge of how to defeat Bill. Stan resents that his authority is being overlooked to rescue a guy he already saved once, but the plan goes underway without him, and the shack is transformed into a mech piloted by the combined efforts of everybody remaining in Gravity Falls who hasn't been turned into a chair. They assault Bill Cipher's giant pyramid and manage to distract him long enough to free most of the people, enough to perform a ritual that will seal him away with the combined efforts of a few key players in the show leading up to this point. But Stanley refuses to make up with his brother, and in the end, their bickering prevents the ritual from working, long enough to accomplish anything. Everybody is captured as a result, with only Dipper and Mabel managing to escape, but Bill hunts them down and decides to torture them to get Ford to agree to let him inside his mind, so that he can learn the way out of Gravity Falls. Ford agrees only for Bill to enter and learn that he's really inside the mind of Stanley. The two switch clothes earlier, and the memory eraser is used to destroy Bill, as well as all of Grunkle Stan's memories of the last summer. But rather than his mind being completely lost, Mabel is able to use her scrapbook of the events to jog his memory, bringing him back to just in time for a final goodbye. While I've spoken at length on the strength of the relationship between Dipper and Mabel, this episode's conclusion ultimately comes as a result of every other connection the two have made thus far. While the mystery twins are close, that closeness by itself means very little without a world to share the feeling with, and this fact ends up being represented when their togetherness serves as a motivating force. First, to the town of Gravity Falls itself, needing that spark of motivation to stand and fight, and later to Stanley and Stan Ford, who finally reconcile their differences enough to make a sacrifice for the sake of family. So the bond between the twins isn't just reflected in how they treat each other, but how others treat each other. If something really is good and worth fighting for, then the people will naturally be drawn towards defending that thing. The town of Gravity Falls helps out the Pines Twins, just as much as the Pines Twins have helped out Gravity Falls. And of course, the finale isn't simply the town declaring to never mention that summer again before moving on. The last real obstacle that needs to be overcome is the wiping of Stanley's memories of the family. Because that love they shared with him is something worthless if it's forgotten about and moved on from. So the town of Gravity Falls can say goodbye to the Pines Twins, despite claiming that they won't think about anything that happened that summer, because they can't forget the people who meant that much. And Grunkle Stan has to regain his memories, because without the memories of those closest to us, we may as well have wasted the whole summer on nothing. Season 2 Season 2 can be thought of as having two parts to it. The first is largely a consequences arc for the various unresolved points of the first season, the resolution of the animosity towards Pacifica, Zeus finally growing into his designated role, and explanations of why the people of Gravity Falls behave the way they do. 
The second half, starting at the introduction of Ford, involves much more in the way of resolving the internal conflicts of characters. We learn of the disagreement between Ford and Stanley that led to their separation, and we learn how this separation led to the events of Weird Mageddon, as together, both brothers would have made a more effective team than apart. Without Stanley in his life, Stanford was unable to recognize a con man when he met Bill, and without Stanford in his life, Stanley found so little meaning as to have spent the last 30 years working through the night to bring him back. But these differences in the characters and their work towards a resolution all serve a large role in the end. We've seen time and time again how Dipper and Mabel's ability to work together has led to greatness in the past, but it takes the whole town to finally beat down Bill and it's their interactions with the Pines twins that lets them be the version of themselves that they need to. Wendy would not have had the savviness to avoid the supernatural and get Dipper to his sister if she had never met the guy. She would have been hiding out with her family. Gideon's desire to become a better person is the only reason he's able to turn his back on Bill after turning to him for help in the first place. And of course, if Dipper and Mabel hadn't taught Pacifica humility, then she never would have had the ability to do what her parents never could, and touch a hillbilly. So the town of Gravity Falls is ultimately the character who receives the most development throughout the series. It's not so much that Dipper and Mabel needed to grow up, as since they had each other, they would be ready to face the future no matter what. But it's the fact that the town was able to band together under the strength of their bond that a happy ending could finally be achieved. And since we've spent so much time with the town, that growth is hopefully reflected in the audience. A person's relationship to a work of media is, in the best case scenario, something that lasts long after the series has finished its run, and as such, the impact of Gravity Falls is something that will stay with its audience, much in the same way that the impact of Dipper and Mabel's childhood will stay with the town. Outro There's a lot of secondary material, like shorts and unaired episodes, that I never brought up in this video, and even more tertiary materials, like ciphers and AMAs, that didn't get broached either. And while at the beginning of the retrospective I said that this was primarily to keep the video focused, it was also a decision meant to add a sense of mystery to a first or even second viewing for anybody who still wants some of the original appeal of the show to remain. Because, while I stated that I left things out as the show was able to stand on its own merits without outside knowledge, the weekly mystery and fandom surrounding the show was a big part of what made its airing so special. So hopefully you, the viewer, can still find some enjoyment if you go back to the show after watching this video, or somehow you watch this video without having seen Gravity Falls in the first place. There's some demand for a potential return to Gravity Falls in the form of a third season or even a spin-off, but this is mostly wishful thinking as many of the head minds working on the show have gone their separate ways following its conclusion. That's not to say that the show's spirit isn't alive and well though. For those who want more Gravity Falls, I highly recommend looking at the other shows that the staff have moved on to. I've covered both Rick and Morty as well as Inside Job on this channel before, but a closer comparison can likely be made to Amphibia or The Owl House both of which have finished their run somewhat recently. And the show's style is something that isn't wholly new, either. Prior to his work on Gravity Falls, series creator Alex Hirsch worked on The Marvelous Misadventures of Flapjack and Fish Hooks. So while the show has reached a logical conclusion, and therefore likely won't see a mainline continuation in the future, fans don't have to worry about some sort of void being left in their lives. I think it's for the best that a lot of the questions never truly got answered. The mystery element is so much elevated by the fact that we still don't know precisely why the weirdness magnet seems to exist around the town of Gravity Falls. And being able to preserve the memory of the mystery, I think, is a much better alternative than having every single question answered. Because when every question has an answer, you stop asking questions. And when you stop asking questions, you stop reliving the moments that meant so much. I appreciate that you've stuck around long enough to see the conclusion of this video, or if you just skipped around to the individual episode reviews and wound up here, I at least appreciate that you bothered engaging with my channel at all. If this is holding your attention, or serving as decent background noise, I have quite a few other videos in the same vein as this one, over shows with, in my opinion, a very similar vibe. In addition, I also have plans to continue making these for as long as I have the motivation to continue making them, which is looking like a long time going forwards. For every video idea I finish, two more ideas pop into my head and get added to the list. Although if you have a suggestion for that list, 
feel free to leave it in the comments below. I read through every single one of them, even if I don't leave a heartfelt reply to all of them. And of course, you can also comment below if you have any miscellaneous feelings on Gravity Falls, or my video about it, in general. Gravity Falls, to me, was a show that I only really watched to keep up with the online discourse surrounding it. The discussions people were having looked interesting enough that there was a sense of FOMO, or fear of missing out, that made me want to see what the discussion was before it inevitably got spoiled. Something about ARGs and ciphers and vague allusions to greater mysteries really speaks to me as an audience member. These videos tend to be pretty time-consuming to make, and as a result, they come out in a period of time that causes the algorithm to lose its attention span, and forget that you ever watched the others. So if you want to see my next videos as they come out, subscribing is a much more effective way than simply letting this website determine what you should watch next. I try to upload on the first of every month, so if you're watching this video around that time, be sure to look out for content to see next. I'm assuming by the fact that you're still listening that you have an interest in this sort of thing, so apologizing in advance, I'm just going to do a little bit of a channel update thingy here. This was not a video about The Simpsons. I am currently working on that and have decided that it's best to alternate, doing three seasons every other month so that this channel doesn't become a Simpsons channel, but also so I can metaphorically stretch my legs. I usually only vaguely tease my next video right before it comes out, but in this case I'm spoiling it well in advance. Oh well. See you all in a month.